This uh, presentation is about nonlinear harmonic analysis of uh, rubber components, or uh, more precisely, how we can include the pain effect in the material description of the rubber for, uh, for harmonic analysis or frequency response analysis. So here is a short overview of the presentation. After a short introdu introduction, uh, we'll review briefly uh, uh, the theory of the models that we've implemented in MARC. Then we will look at a number of examples where different models uh, have been used. And then we will look at how we can put it to work in the MARC and MENTAT program. And we'll conclude with a short summary. So the pain effect, or it's also known as the Fletcher-Ghent effect, it is well known that many filled rubbers show a pronounced effect of the amplitude on the storage and the loss modulus when they are subjected to harmonic loads. And so if we have a strain excitation with a certain frequency uh, omega, then we get a stress response um, with the same frequency, but it's not in, in phase with, uh, with our strain excitation. And we have an in-phase term that is controlled by the storage modulus, and we have an out-of-phase term that is controlled by the loss modulus. And if we include the pain effect, the storage and loss moduli are dependent on the amplitude of the strain excitation. It is, in general, it is observed that the storage modulus is high for very small amplitudes, and then drops when the amplitude increases to some asymptotic uh, minimum whereas the loss modulus reaches a maximum value at some intermediate amplitude of the excitation. So applications, I think there are many, because many uh, rubber materials that are used in, in industry have these added filler components to improve the mechanical properties of the rubber. So everywhere where uh, these components are dynamically loaded and where the rubber is used in the supports or mounts or bushings, uh, this type of analysis can be of interest. Uh, one important assumption that we made, we have made in the pain effect is that it is reversible. That means when the dynamic loading stops, we assume that uh, the material recovers from uh, any micro-mechanical damage that may have occurred. And this contrasts it to the Mullins effect, uh, which in general shows a permanent damage. Uh, we also assume that it uh, only affects the deviatory response of the rubber, because in most cases the rubber is incompressible or nearly incompressible. And then we make also make the assumption that the harmonic analysis is a uh, linear perturbation around some static equilibrium state. This can be the undeformed state, but can also be a deformed state with pre-stress with uh, large uh, static deformations. But the harmonic excitations as such are small uh, perturbations around this equilibrium state, uh, which means that this uh, capability is not meant for arbitrary large harmonic excitations. But within this small uh, harmonic um, excitation or vibration amplitude, we already observe the nonlinear effect that the storage and loss behavior becomes amplitude dependent. So that means that our harmonic sub-increments, as they are known in Mark, so the solution that we seek at each frequency excitation, these harmonic sub-increments become nonlinear because we don't know the vibration amplitude beforehand. So with this nonlinearity, we can uh, observe some interesting effects that we could not observe when only doing a linear frequency response analysis. Uh, here we show the results of an example that we will also see later, where we have compared the linear uh, solution with a nonlinear solution, and we did an excitation at three different load levels. In the linear case, so if we exclude the pain effect, uh, we observe that uh, 
the peak frequencies in this case are always the same and uh, the peaks at this frequency just scale uh, proportionally with the applied loading and so it's not really interesting to do three different load levels because if we know the first load level then we can immediately predict the response at the higher load levels as well but in the nonlinear case if we include the pain effect and we observe that uh, because of the changes in stiffness and damping that we have a shift of the peaks and also that uh, these uh, peak values no longer scale linearly with the uh, applied loading and so these are uh, these are effects that we can only see if we include the pain effect so the models we have implemented in MARC, so we could put them in two categories. One is one, the first category are uh, the phenomenological models. Uh, these are models which have a, a mathematical description that involve material parameters that we first have to evaluate from any measured response of storage and loss moduli. And the second category probably more easy to use uh, are the tabular models where we can use the measured storage and loss data uh, almost, almost uh, unchanged in the form of tables and then finally there's also a user-defined model where you can write your own user subroutine and so the phenomenological models um, the first one is an extension of the Prony series model or the Maxwell viscoelasticity model uh, where uh, process dependent relaxation times are introduced. The second one we've called the triboelastic model is based on a cyclic plasticity approach to uh, to describe the damping behavior in the, mi in the material when being uh, loaded uh, harmonically. Um, then the next model is the Krauss and Ulmer model. Um, Krauss was one of the first, I think, that gave a quantitative description of the pain effect for storage and loss moduli as a function of the, of, uh, the amplitude. And we've also included this model in Mark. And then finally, the first two models in the list can also be combined, as we will see later. So let's look at the first model, the Tixotropic model. As mentioned, it's a generalized Maxwell model or based on the Prony series, but we've included process dependent relaxation times. So the generalized Maxwell model, rheologically, we can see it as in the picture on the right. Uh, each Maxwell element is a spring and a damper element in series, and a number of these elements are combined in parallel. And here, we see a, a short summary of the time representation of this model. The actual stress is the instantaneous stress minus the sum of a number of internal stress variables that describe the relaxation process or processes that go on in each of the Maxwell elements. But now the relaxation times in this model are not constant, but they are time dependent, which is represented by this variable ZK. And this, the dependence of this variable is driven by another internal variable for each Maxwell element. And this, the behavior of this variable is driven by the deformation history. The magnitude D here is um, the deformation rate. So the behavior of the relaxation time in this model depends on the deformation history. So we recognize that for a material constants for each Maxwell element, two are the usual Prony series constants. Uh, the relaxation time, the ones encircled in red, are the ones we also know from a Prony series. The relaxation time tau and the Prony factor G for each Maxwell element. But in addition to include the pain effect, um, there appear two other constants. This constant uh, DK that 
is related to say the intrinsic time scale of each Maxwell element and the lambda k which can be considered as a relaxation time of the, on the micro scale. Now this is a time domain um, formulation of the model but we are only interested here in the frequency domain application and uh, in that case in the first order Fourier uh, response of the model we don't see the lambda k of the Maxwell element so in our frequency domain application only the three material constants tau g and d are needed so the tau and the g are the Brony coefficients that we already know from linear uh, viscoelastic behavior and the d is a parameter that allows us to include the pain effect uh, so if we have a, a perturbation again periodically with a frequency omega then we have a stress response that is partly in phase and partly out of phase and so the in phase part is controlled by the storage factor and the out of phase part is uh, the damping part is controlled by the loss factor and for this model they can be represented by these series expansions where we see that there is not only a dependency on frequency but also a dependency on the amplitude of the vibration because of this constant dk that appears in the formulation of each actual element so if we set dk to zero for each Maxwell element we get the usual series expansion that we also know for the Prony series and so this model can be regarded as an extension of the Prony series model the second model that we have is the triboelastic model it's based on a cyclic plasticity approach so called a generalized Prandtl model where we have here a number of Prandtl elements in parallel each Prandtl element consists of a spring element and a slip element and in a plasticity uh, formulation we then get a, a hysteresis loop if we do a cyclic loading of the material and this hysteresis loop uh, allows us to account for a damping behavior and also stiffness behavior that uh, makes the, the behavior dependent on the amplitude now these this um, this uh, hysteresis loop is already determined by the primary loading path uh, models like this um, adhere to the so-called Mason rule uh, which which says that the unloading and the reloading path are simply of the same shape as the initial loading path but they are scaled by a factor of two in uh, both directions in in the X and in the Y direction so again if we do a, a strain perturbation but now we'll do the excitation with a cosine function we again get an in phase part and an out of phase part uh, where the in phase part or the storage factor is given by this integral expression and the loss factor is given by this integral expression uh, where um, where we see the dependence of the storage and loss factors on the amplitude of the vibration which is represented here by the gamma bar we also see that in this model that there is no explicit frequency dependence and so it's independent of the frequency that we've used for the excitation but we see that there is a strong amplitude dependence now these integrals may be difficult to evaluate in general but if we make the assumption that the plasticity curve that we saw on the previous slide can be approximated by a number of piecewise linear segments then these storage and loss factors can be evaluated in closed form and we can use easily use them in the analysis 
So the unknowns for the material model in this case are the points of this plasticity stress strain curve. It should be noted here that we don't really measure this stress, stress strain curve in a tensile test or in a shear test, but we always measure storage and loss moduli, and then by some fitting procedure, we will have to find the points of this uh, curve to represent the storage and the loss behavior that we have measured. So the third model is the krauss ulmer model. Uh, Krauss gave a quantitative description based on breakage and recovery of bonds at the micro level. And uh, with his analysis, he came up with these expressions for the storage and uh, loss moduli. Um, in the loss modulus, this last term, this exponentially decaying term, was actually added by uh, Ulmer uh, to get a better color correlation with his uh, measured data. We see that in this model, there are eight material constants. We have the, the G primes and the G double primes. Um, the knots and the infinity here relate to the magnitude of the amplitude. So the G naught prime is the storage modulus at very low amplitude, and the G infinity prime is the storage modulus at a very high amplitude, and the same for the loss moduli. We have an exponent m, and the gamma c is the amplitude of the vibration where the loss modulus reaches its maximum, and this maximum value of the loss modulus is given by the GM. So again, we see that this model has no explicit uh, frequency dependency, only a dependence on the amplitude. But a frequency dependency could be included with uh, the use of tables. And we could also use that for other dependencies, like maybe the temperature. The same goes for the previous model, the triboelastic model, which also had no explicit dependence on the frequency, but uh, this could also be included when using uh, tables. Then the next model, from uh, the, the user point of view, probably the most easy to use, is the tabular model, uh, where we use tables for the storage and loss behavior. So this circumvents the data fitting problem that we have when we uh, use phenomenological models. And these table models come in two flavors. One we've called uh, multi-dimensional tables, uh, where the storage modulus and the loss modulus are a function of the frequency, the amplitude, and possibly the static pre-deformation and the temperature. And we can have up to four independent variables to define this uh, dependency in Mark. And the second model, the multiplicative uh, model, if, um, if by some assumption we can separate the different effects of frequency and amplitude and possibly the static pre-deformation, then and we assume that the resulting complex modulus is then the product of these three effects. Now, when we use the tables, they have to be uh, normalized in some form because uh, the product of the complex uh, storage, uh, of the complex modulus with the stress-strain law that we derive from the hyperelastic function, so from a Mooney or a Ogden uh, hyperelastic function, this product determines the storage modulus and the loss modulus of the material. So we have to normalize these tables so that consistently, so that we get the right storage and loss values as a function of frequency and amplitude. Now in the Mark 2013 version, we insisted that uh, this normalization was always done with the instantaneous modulus. So that is the, or the instantaneous stiffness. So that is the storage modulus if the frequency gets very high. So here, if it goes to infinity, 
it reaches some asymptotic value which represents the instantaneous response of the material, stiffness response of the material. But often in our measurements we cannot measure up to such high frequencies, so we don't reach this asymptotic uh, branch of the curve yet. In that case, the trick would be to just choose the highest value of the curve for the normalization to make sure that the storage and loss factors that, are, that uh, are, appear in the analysis are always between 0 and 1. But in 2015, we've relaxed this condition, and you can now use, do a normalization at uh, any uh, reference frequency of your choice. So you could also normalize the storage and loss factors with the uh, long-term or equilibrium stiffness of the material, which is the stiffness when you load it statically uh, in a very slow motion. Then the last uh, set of models are combined models of the tixotropic and the triboelastic uh, model. Um, the first one is an additive combination, uh, which you can view of as uh, putting the spring dashpot and spring slip elements all in parallel, and then you can simply add the contributions to the moduli of each of the elements. And the second one uh, is perhaps a bit more difficult to imagine uh, rheologically, but is a multiplicative combination of the tixotropic and the triboelastic uh, models. And then finally, there's a user subroutine, U-Pain, where you can implement a model of your own. And there's also a subroutine where you can implement your own amplitude based on the strain tensors. And in the documentation, we've outlined how this amplitude for the vibration is calculated, but it's just a normed value of the strain tensor. But in this subroutine, you could also define another norm. So as mentioned before, um, because of the amplitude dependence, we get a nonlinear set of equations. And so we have to solve that in, uh, in an iterative uh, manner. And so here we see the harmonic equations in uh, complex arithmetic. And the, the real parts of the system matrix are the inertia parts, so related to the math, mass matrix, and the stiffness parts. Uh, the material stiffness and the geometric stiffness. And the damping part of the matrix is, uh, is the imaginary part. In a linear frequency response analysis, there is no dependence on the amplitude. And this amplitude is directly dependent on the solution vector. So in that case, there is no dependence on the solution vector, and the whole system is a linear a system when we can solve it in one go. But if we include the pain effect, this amplitude becomes dependent on the solution vector. And so we, have, we iterate a number of cycles. We make an initial estimate at each frequency for the amplitude. We solve the harmonic equations at that frequency with our estimated amplitude. We update the amplitude check the convergence, and if it's not converged, we redo the harmonic equations with the updated amplitude, and we repeat this until we have convergence. So now let's look at a few examples. The first one is a rubber block, which is loaded in simple shear. It's a force-controlled initial loading and also a force-controlled uh, vibration. The load is applied at the top surface of the block. And at the top surface, we also have uh, a distributed uh, mass. We ignore the mass of the rubber. And with all these assumptions, this basically reduces to a single de degree of freedom uh, mass spring system with uh, damping. The elastic behavior of the rubber is uh, given by this Mooney-Rivlin function, where we have used these, uh, these material constants. And the viscoelastic behavior is a one-term Aproni series, 
with this added uh, tixotropic effect, so we also have used this intrinsic time parameter. Then here again we see the re relations for the storage and loss factors, where there is also this amplitude dependence. Here we see the relevant deformation um, expressions and the stress and stiffness. And if we do a harmonic excitation, then with a certain frequency, then we also get a harmonic response with the same frequency, but probably possibly with a different phase. And the harmonic equation of motion in this case is um, is a nonlinear equation, which we can uh, we can solve quasi analytically because it's just a single degree of freedom system. And then we get the results that we uh, we already saw in the introduction. And so here we've applied three different load levels, and we've compared the linear solution with the nonlinear solution. At the linear solution, we observe that uh, frequency or the frequency where the response peaks is always the same, and also that these peaks scale linearly with the applied load. But if we include this nonlinear effect we see that uh, there is a shift of the frequency where the response peaks and also that these peak levels and also the other levels no longer scale linearly with the applied load. So we clearly see nonlinear effects uh, of the behavior. And he, in the last slide for this example, uh, we see the storage and loss factors. Uh, the green curves here are the storage and loss factors for uh, the linear case. So they are independent of the level of loading. They only depend on the frequency. But the other curves also include the amplitude dependence. And we see that when we reach the peak frequency, uh, uh, that also the, the stiffness drops. So that explains why we see a left shift in, uh, in the previous uh, figure. And we also observe that there is a strong nonlinear uh, dependence of the damping uh, as a result of this pain effect. The second example is a rubber block loaded in tension. And here we've also uh, included a temperature effect of the material behavior. So the block is fixed at the top surface and it's loaded at the bottom surface. The top surface is, is kept at um, a fixed temperature of 50 degrees and the bottom surface at 20 degrees. The side surfaces are insulated, so we get a linear temperature drop from the top to the bottom surface from 50 to 20 degrees. So we have a temperature, a non-constant temperature distribution in the structure. And here we have done two analysis, compare two analysis. In the first analysis, the material representation was done entirely through tables. So the static elasticity response, for the static elasticity response, we used the Marlowe model. So we could directly use the results of a uniaxial tensile a test for the long-term behavior of the material. And we've generated tables for the storage and loss factors where there is a dependence on the frequency, the amplitude, and the temperature. And in the second, uh, in our reference model, we used, uh, say, phenomenological models for, uh, for the material behavior. So the elastic response was given by a Ghent function, and the viscoelastic response was, again, given by a one-term Brony uh, series with tixotropic effects. And the temperature dependence was given by a shift function, where we have assumed that the material still behaves as a thermorheologically simple material. Now, there's one difference in this model, in the two models, um, that in the first case, in the tab tabular case, we used the long-term stiffness for the normalization of the tables. And in 
the reference model with the Ghent elasticity, we use the short-term stiffness. But uh, the results, of course, of both analysis have to be the same because, in fact, this Marlowe curve and the storage and loss tables were generated by me simply by from these functions. So here again we see the storage and loss moduli as a function of the frequency, as a function of the amplitude, and here also as a function of the temperature, where, uh, where we have made the assumption of thermorheologically simple material behavior. Uh, usually this means that the relaxation times are controlled by the so-called shift functions, shift function. But if we make the same assumption for this intrinsic time parameter, so if it undergoes the same shift in the frequency domain, it can be observed that the whole behavior of the storage and loss moduli are uh, thermorheologically simple. And this means that the curves here at different temperatures and different, um, or at each amplitude, they all make the same shift in the frequency uh, domain. And then we get, of course, the same results. Here I've plotted uh, contour plots of the storage and loss moduli. Now, we observe a difference in the values on the left side and the right side of the storage and loss factors, but that is due to our choice in normalization that I've just mentioned. And so there's a factor difference between the left and the right curves where the factor is determined as the ratio between the, the long-term stiffness and the short-term stiffness. Then the next model is a rubber bushing model. We have a bushing which is fixed in a housing, but the housing is not uh, explicitly shown here in the figure. So we see the bushing which is carrying a shaft, and this uh, shaft is loaded in vertical direction. Uh, first by a static load and then additionally by uh, a harmonic load, all displacement controlled. And here we have used the additive combination of the tixotropic and triboelastic uh, models, which in rheological terms means that we have a number of Maxwell elements in parallel with a number of Pronto elements. Here we have one spring element so that describes, say, the rubber behavior in the model. And we have two Maxwell elements describing the damping behavior. And we have three, uh, three Pronto elements describing the internal friction behavior of the material. Now, in the Maxwell element, we didn't include the tixotropic effects. So this constant, constants d were all set to 0. So the amplitude-dependent response in this model is purely due to the presence of these pronto elements. So here we look at uh, some of the results. Uh, the dynamic stiffness is a, a, a parameter of interest. It's defined as the magnitude of the external uh, or of the reaction force by the magnitude of the um, vibration amplitude or the displacement amplitude of the excitation. So we clearly again see a nonlinearity in uh, in the this in the um, dependence of the amplitude. And we see that at increasing amplitudes, the dynamic stiffness drops, and we see a, a minor dependency on the frequency. Now on the left side we see the results where we haven't applied the preload, but on the right side we see the results where we have applied, applied a static preload. And we basically see the same trends but at uh, different load or at different uh, levels. And the dynamic stiffness also changes a little bit because of the presence of the static preload. Then the last model is an isolation device. 
Um, we here have a frame which is mounted on four supports. The frame carries a structure which is not modeled in detail, but we've just represented its presence by a point mass to include its inertia. And these supports here have rubber pads to cushion the dynamic excitation that is applied to our structural part. And then we, um, we analyze the total reaction force by uh, combining all the, all the reaction forces of the four supports with some rigid body elements, so we get one total reaction force. Then the storage and loss moduli, um, we did again two analysis, one where we used the measured data directly in the f with uh, tables, and we've also made a fit for storage and loss moduli with the with this multiplicative combined tixotropic triboelastic model, and in these in this slide we see the results of these fits for storage and loss moduli. These um, the fits looks look okay. They they look okay. Uh, I think. And then we look at uh, if we look at one uh, in result quantity that is of interest, uh, which is called the transmissibility, uh, which is defined as the ratio of the max the the magni magnitude of the reaction force and the max magnitude of the excitation load. Then in the linear case, of course, this would always be a constant value because if we would scale the excitation load with a certain value, the reaction force would also scale with the same value, so the transmissibility would always be the same. But we, because we include the pain effect, we see there is a dependence on the magnitude of the load. At increasing load levels, we see that, uh, first of all, again, the peak results shift in the frequency range, but we also see that um, the peak levels of the transmissibility depend on the amount of the applied loading. Now on the left side, we see the results of the tabular model, and on the right side, we see the results of the multiplicative model, and basically, they both predict the same trends but uh, a little, with a little bit different values. So now let's look at how we can put it to work in uh, MARC and MENTOT to do the analysis with MARC. First of all, this, these models are only available for isotropic uh, materials. So in the analysis, you have to choose a hyperelastic model uh, like a Mooney or Ogden or any of the other material, hyperelastic material models that we have available, or you can also use a linear elastic isotropic uh, material model. And then we have to define the viscoelastic material data, so we can define the frequency dependency through the uh, options that we already know. But we've introduced a new option, which is the pain option, to include the amplitude dependence. And then you can also include effects of the static pre-deformation or effects of the temperature by uh, defining a shift function. And so in MARC, we have to switch on the harmonic parameter in the parameter deck to tell the program that we're going to do a, a complex harmonic analysis. And so uh, an analysis where we use complex arithmetic with real and imaginary parts. And we also have to include the inertia effects in the residual uh, force and reaction force calculation. But if students fit on the uh, pain effect, this will be included by default. And because of the nonlinearity in the harmonic response, we also have to make control settings for the convergence. 
And so the solution method that we have available is the direct substitution method that we've seen in one of the previous slides. And then we can use either displacement or the residual uh, testing criteria, but not the strain ener energy criterion that is also available in static analysis. So we can use displacement and or residual criteria. These two can be combined if you want. And then there's a, a choice for the initial amplitude. By default, we always take the amplitude of the previous uh, frequency step. But uh, if for some reason you want to start with the zero amplitude, that's also possible. And then there is an assembly weight factor, which by default is three, and which probably the user never has to change. So an important aspect here is the history definition. And we first define static load cases if we want to apply a static preload and then define the harmonic uh, load cases where we can repeat a few harmonic load cases if we basically want to do the same load with the, with the, the, the same types of loads and the same frequency sweeps but uh, with, different, um, with different load levels we can control these load levels by defining a so-called harmonic load factor and then we can re simply repeat a number of these harmonic load cases. We must keep in mind here that the sub-increment counter keeps on incrementing. <coughs> so that means if we had a static analysis which does 10 increments, and then we do a first harmonic load case with 100 frequencies, then we get, uh, as a sub-increment results, we get increment 10.1 up to 10.100. And if we repeat, repeat the harmonic load case, but with another uh, harmonic load factor, again we get to 100 frequencies, then they start counting from 10.101 up to 10.200, etc. This is something you have to keep in mind when you make history plots of the results. Then each harmonic load case, we need to define the load case option, where we select the loads and boundary conditions, we need to define the harmonic option where we set uh, the frequencies and we can define the harmonic load factor and because of the nonlinearity we also need to control option for convergence settings. And then as results, harmonic results, uh, we get the usual harmonic results uh, of displacements, uh, external and reaction forces, harmonic stresses and strains, the dissipated power. And now in addition we also have the vibration amplitude as a result and the storage and loss factors. And then we can we also already had the total dissipated power summed over the whole model. And so these uh, results can be post-processed as usual increments and the sub-increments, so we can make contour plots or history plots with any uh, post-processor. In uh, Mentat, we have to enter the material data in the material properties menu, and so we have to select an elasticity model like uh, Mooney or Ogden, and then we have swi to switch on viscoelasticity for this material and then we choose a viscoelastic model uh, where here we've chosen the tixotropic model but if we open this menu here we would also see the other manuals, models that we've reviewed, uh, triboelastic combined models, the Krauss-Ulmer model and the tabular models and depending on uh, the choice of the material model we enter a, a, a menu where we can enter the the data, the material data specific to that material model. And then we can include effects of the static pre-deformation and thermorheologically simple a, a shift function if we want to. And then for the job we have to define load cases and a, a job in the load case job menus. And for the load cases we select the loads 
and we can combine them with a harmonic load factor if we want to scale them in different harmonic uh, load cases. Uh, we do solution control and convergence testing, uh, which is new in the harmonic analysis. And we set the frequency range uh, for the frequencies where we that we want to analyze. Then in the jobs menu, uh, we have to select the load cases. So we can first select a static load case to apply the static preload and then do the harmonic load case. Or we can repeat harmonic load cases with different harmonic load factors. And then for the analysis options, we have, of course, to choose a large strain if we do large strain effects in the static preloading. And as we've seen, we have to use complex damping and the inertia effects. And then we're set to go. And so in summary, we've seen that all models are capable of including the amplitude dependence in the frequency response of the precessed rubber components. And we also saw that we could see nonlinear effects that could not be analyzed with a purely linear frequency response approach. Uh, we saw the shifting effect and this non-proportional uh, scaling effect of the peak responses. We always assume that the frequency response is carried out as a per perturbation around a possibly nonlinear static equilibrium state. So again, it's not meant for arbitrary large uh, harmonic excitations. And in, the, in addition to the amplitude, uh, we can have dependencies on the frequency, the temperature, and the amount of static pre-deformation. And so the basic input for, for this type of analysis uh, always consists of uh, information for the storage modulus and the loss modulus uh, in taking into account effects of frequency and damping and possibly other factors. Uh, so these are the quantities that you will have to measure. And of course, you need a hyperelastic uh, material model for the static uh, behavior. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. I would like to thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, we can open it up for questions. Thank you.